this. I need to click on the recording sign. All right, let's see if anybody else is popping into the room before we get started. Okay. One or two entering. Okay, we're one minute after the start time, so I'd like to get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Guy Lam. I'm with the Safety and Violence Initiative at UCT, but also with the Department of Political Science at Stellenbosch University. Uh, welcome to our first webinar for June for Safer Spaces. And for those of you who don't know Safer Spaces, it's a collaboration between civil society organizations, scholars, academics, practitioners working in the, the field of violence prevention, safety promotion. And a key partner on this is actually government. We work with the Civilian Secretariat for Police Services and funding is very generously provided by GIZ, German uh, Technical Funding. Um, they've been funding Safer Spaces right since the start of you know, four or five years ago and are continuing to provide funding for it. And this year is the first time we've been doing webinars, obviously with COVID-19. We haven't had the opportunity to do in-person uh, seminars, but we're doing webinars. So we've had a number of them certainly since the beginning of the year. So this is the webinar, the first one we're doing on private security. So we're very lucky to have two eminent specialists, experts in the field. Uh, both are South African, but uh, working in different parts of the world sometimes. So we have uh, Clifford Shearing, who is based at uh, UCT, but also at Griffith University in, in Australia, but has uh, multiple uh, affiliations too. And we also have uh, Julie Berg, who is uh, formerly from UCT in the Center of Criminology, but she's been at uh, University of Glasgow for a number of years now. So um, before we get started, let me give you a bit more detail about this particular webinar. Um, the title of the webinar is Private Security Lines of Flight. So it's looking at some of the broader issues, some of the conceptual issues, some, some abstract issues around private security. So Julie and Clifford will be considering the implications of the shifting 21st century harm landscapes, or what they call harmscapes for private security. They will reflect on the emergence of novel harmscapes associated with environmental and cyber harms. And they'll draw on examples across different jurisdictions, and they'll explore how private security has adapted in responding to these novel harmscapes thereby identifying possible future trajectories of all lines of flight. Their talk will conclude with a reflection on the implications of this for the South African context. So just a bit more about Julie and Clifford. So Dr. Julie Berg is a senior lecturer in criminology at the School of Social and Political Sciences and the Associate Director of Internationalization of the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Clifford Shearing is a Professor Emeritus in the Faculty of Law at UCT, where he directs the Global Risk Governance Programme within the Department of Public Law. He's also got a fairly recent book out with Holly and Fellon. It's called Criminology and Climate, Finance, Insurance, and the Regulation of Hanscapes. So it's come out this year, published by Rutledge. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start the webinar. Um, Julie's gonna speak first, and, and then after Julie will be Clifford. We have um, about an hour and 25 minutes. Um, so hopefully we should have about 20 to 30 minutes for discussion at least after the two speakers have spoken. So I'm going to uh, mute myself now and hand over to Julie. Um, and it's all Julie. And then after Julie, we'll have Clifford. So Julie, over to you. Thank you, Guy. Um, we have actually got Clifford and then me, then Clifford and me again. So <laughs> I'm uh, maneuvering the PowerPoint. So if anything goes wrong, it's okay. completely my fault. So Clifford will take it away and then we'll take turns in speaking. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Off to you. Over to you, Clifford. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Guy, um, and thanks for all joining us today. <clears throat> so over the next 30 minutes or so, I will be sharing with you emerging thoughts, Julie and I, on global developments in policing and their implications for private security, including South African developments. I will start off just to provide context with some historically focused introductory remarks about, the de about developments in policing. I will introduce you to the idea of, of, of harm landscapes. That as you heard guys say, Julie and I um, are going to call harmscapes. And we will introduce you to the role of harmscapes actually as drivers of developments in policing. Then, 
uh, Julie will uh, take over and we'll, and, and we'll move from a discussion of policing generally that I'm going to do to uh, a discussion focused on private security. By considering developments that have taken place and that are taking place in relation to what we call shifting homescapes. Then it'll be back to me again. And I will look from the present to the future and look at what lines of flights we find in the present that are suggesting different futures. <clears throat> so this is what you have in store for you. And finally, Julie will, will come on board again and she will, uh, she will explore whether there are any um, resonances in South African developments. And then it'll be time for us to have a discussion. So let me get going. Time is tight, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, and I will be brief, perhaps not brief enough. <clears throat> Within the English speaking world, there have been two significant shifts in policing. These developments have been so significant that we might th think of them constituting revolutions in policing. The first revolution was the development of public policing and the emergence of state police organizations that we all take for granted now. They weren't always here. Within the English speaking world, a crucial event in the emergence of state policing was ironically the development of a private policing organization known as the Marine Police and later as the Thames Police. This organization was established by and paid for by merchants to protect goods moving through the docks in London. The Marine Police proved to be very successful. The theft of goods on the docks was reduced significantly. As a consequence of this, a reform movement emerged that advocated the extension of the sort of policing that the Marine Police were doing across London. These reform, reformers were pretty uh, noisy. They, they, made, uh, uh, they, were, they were quite vociferous in their arguments to rethink policing. So we might think of this, uh, and you'll see why I'm saying it a little while time, as rather a noisy revolution in policing. And this noisy advocacy led to the establish of the London Metropolitan Police. And the Met, as it came to be called, was, of course, it wasn't a private organization, but a public organization, not paid for by merchants, but paid for by governments. This development of a police organization paid for by government was very different to what had gone on before and was indeed quite revolutionary. What was similar about the Marine Police and the Met was their organization and the ideas about policing that they both embodied. <clears throat> The London Metropolitan Police soon emerged as a model for policing, not only across England, but across the English speaking world. Let me just add a small caveat here. There is a tweak to the story that has to do with the Irish constabulary, but there isn't any need for me to go into this here. <clears throat> the shadow of these London and Irish based developments in public policing has been a very long one indeed. And as a consequence, public policing and public police organization built along these lines continue to be around today across the English speaking world. However, from, uh, so from about the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, this form of policing, public policing became the dominant form of policing within English speaking countries. And people talked about the state monopolizing policing. And then quite suddenly around the middle of the 20th century, policing researchers began to realize that things were changing and changing rather quickly and rather drastically and dramatically. What was happening was that private policing 
was starting to reemerge as a significant presence and place in. What was happening was that organizations, not unlike the marine police, began to reemerge. These developments led some researchers to argue that a second revolution was underway in policing. And they noted that these developments, although they were very significant, were happening with very little fanfare. To recognize this, these researchers called this second revolution a quiet revolution. As a result of, these, of this quiet revolution, private policing soon began, much to everyone's surprise, to outnumber public police very significantly. The ratios were in the range of two to three to, to one, and in some places, quite a bit more. As a result of these developments, it became clearer that the public police organizations no longer dominated the policing arena to the extent that they had. Instead of policing, uh, instead policing was now being shared between the public police and private police organizations. This led to the Canadian policing scholar, Jean-Paul Bourdieu, to talk of the emergence of a policing web or the web of policing that included both private and public sector professionals doing policing. While much was changing within policing, what remained pretty stable across these revolutions was what policing was about. That is what remained stable was what was being policed. P put in our terms, what remained stable were the harmscapes, the harm landscapes that were being policed. And central to these harmscapes was, as you all know, property theft and, per and interpersonal violence. We might think of these harms as the taking and hitting harms, and these as taking and hitting harmscapes. And this is more or less where things stood as the 20th century drew to a close. What we had were a public and private policing organizations, policing, hitting, and taking harmscapes. But since then, things have begun to change. And they have begun changing again pretty suddenly, pretty drastically, and pretty quickly. To quote Bob Dylan, the times, they are changing. And there have been lots of changes. And these changes have brought with them significant shifts in harmscapes that are impacting policing. Two sets of changes and their associated harmscapes stand out. They stand out for two reasons. First, because of their global reach. These are not local changes. These are international global changes. And, and, and second, and, and second, there, there has been their significant impacts on safety and security. So we have these big changes globally and impacting our safety and security. So one of these developments has been the emergence, this is certainly big, of a new Earth, a new planet Earth that is behaving very differently to the Earth we have inhabited for the past 12,000 years or so. This Earth is being called the Anthropocene to recognize the role that we humans have played in shaping these changes. Perhaps the most obvious and widely recognized of these Anthropocene developments is climate change. The earth has been heating up and this heating is bringing about climatic shifts that are leading to a new normal 
characterized by more extreme weather-related events and many other things. Indeed, one of the terms that has been used to recognize this emerging new normal has been that we live in a new age, an age of catastrophe. Think wildfires, drought, heat waves, cyclones, floodings, and so on. And these new harmscapes, not surprisingly, are bringing with them new policing challenges right across the policing web. And this brings me to the second global development I mentioned, namely the emergence of cyberspace as a new realm of existence. And along with this realm, the emergence of a new set of intelligent entities, AI, with whom we interact, all of us, on a daily basis. Think cyber attacks, ransomware, phishing, crashed computers, disrupting banking and global supply chains, and much more. James Lovelock has termed these cyber developments a novacine to emphasize their newness. So we have a novacine and an anthropocene. And these new cyberspaces are bringing with them new harms, new harmscapes, as we've just been outlining. And together, these harmscapes are challenging policing organizations. And these challenges are affecting both the philosophies of policing and the way policing is being practiced. And this, in turn, is impacting how policing is organized. It, it's impacting police organizations. And all of this is true, particularly with respect to private security. And it is these impacts on private security that will be the focus of the remainder of our remarks today. And now over to Julie who will give us a taste of the sort of developments that are emerging within the private security sector as these landscapes unfold. So thank you, Clifford. This part of our talk will briefly reflect on some of the ways in which private security has been responding to the new homescapes, i.e. the Anthropocene and the Novocene. And so I just, uh, I'm going to outline three examples, but there are many, many more examples. And so the first example that I want to draw out is of what is what Mark Button, who's an uh, English criminologist and private security scholar, has called the new private security. And this is in reference to Clifford's term that he used to describe this second revolution of, of the quiet revolution of private security. He calls this, Mark Button calls this, the second quiet revolution. And this is in reference, this new private security and the second quiet revolution is the fact that private security dominates the policing of cyberspace. Uh, and he calls the public police minority players. And he's coming from a UK perspective as well. But also the emergence of a number of new types of private security, which move beyond traditional conceptions of what private security usually entails. So for instance, again, drawing from Mark Button's work, he refers to a number of professional roles, such as security architects who design cybersecurity systems, security software developers who develop the software for online security systems, cyber incident responders who deal with security incidents, security auditors who check compliance with systems, and what are called ethical hackers who test systems to see if they can be hacked. So there are many, many more specialist roles, but he also outlines some of the activities that this entails, some of the activities associated with these roles, such as entire cybersecurity solutions, which companies tend to outsource to the private sector, and there's a security component embedded into that. So cybersecurity solutions are outsourced, which involves designing, building, and maintaining security systems altogether, monitoring for, for threats, putting in place measures to deal with such threats, um, 
that's again referring to this kind of ethical hacking, penetrating systems to check for vulnerabilities, raising awareness, of course, around threats or phishing scams and things like that, responding to attacks after they've happened, and also conducting investigations around digital systems when th some things have gone wrong, and also dealing with the recovery after there's been a, a, a major attack. Again, ensuring systems comply with data regulations. There's also a range of software products that private sector is involved in antivirus malware detection, but also kind of a frontline function of moderating websites. So these roles that the private sector has embraced really outnumber the public police considerably. And again, drawing from the UK, a media report says that there's about 289,000 cybersecurity professionals in the UK, which is almost twice the total number of the entire UK public police officer number. And that just accounts for cybersecurity professionals. And, and there's still an estimated shortage of about 4 million cybersecurity professionals across the world, which will predominantly be taken up by private security. And so it's also a very much a growing industry. Um, so the estimates have placed that it's, its market value was about 137 billion US dollars in 2017. And this is predicted to rise to 231 billion US dollars in 2022. So this is a fast developing industry which has to evolve with the changing nature of harms associated with cyberspace and the development of artificial intelligence and private security is at the center of that. So my second example, um, is really looking at two examples in one, and this is private security and the environment. And they're conventional frontline activities of private security companies increasingly taking on uh, frontline activities to do with wildlife protection. So the image on the right there is a private conservation force, private companies are deployed to safeguard endangered or ta uh, targeted wildlife. And obviously, a good example is the South African context where private security is used in the protection of rhinos in, in South Africa. But there's another dimension to this, and that's the image on the left, this image of the fire and rescue. Another dimension is the role of private security in protecting critical infrastructure and the natural disasters associated with that, not just natural disasters, but also human made disasters as well as targeted terrorist attacks, for instance. So South Africa, of course, has had a very long history with private security protecting critical infrastructures such as the mines, but this is taken to another level. So given the impacts of climate change and the increase of natural disasters that's associated with that, the role of private security within this becomes a burgeoning business. So for instance, um, there's a particular private security group in Australia, in Brisbane, and it's responsible for Australia's main port or harbour. Uh, at Brisbane Harbour, and it has its own emergency response team, its own medical response team, including ambulances, paramedics, medical staff. It's got its own fire and rescue service, complete with firefighters, a fleet of fire and rescue vehicles and equipment. Company also operates internationally. So for instance, it was hired to provide support after the Christchurch earthquakes in New Zealand, as well as providing consultancy all over the world to government emergency response departments. So yeah, it's taking on a frontline take over the state function where it has its own fleet of fire and rescue vehicles to engage with natural disasters as well as other types of, of disasters. The third example I wanna use is obviously related to this public health crisis of COVID. And so the example that I'm drawing from is from a report by the Confederation of European Security Services. Uh, and the image that you see on the PowerPoint at the moment is the picture of this report. And it's called the New Normal 2.0, Private Security and COVID-19. And so this report provides interesting examples in terms of private security's role during COVID in Europe in particular. And so obviously there's a continuation of its function, traditional functions of protecting businesses, especially during lockdowns, abandoned businesses, guarding premises, but there's also other types of things in terms of carrying on that function of protecting critical infrastructures, um, ensuring business continuity, but also protecting land, air and maritime supply chains uh, in terms of, for instance, transportation of medical supplies. And private security officers, according to the report, were also involved in implementing infection prevention and control measures at hospitals, social care facilities and supermarkets. For example, there's a, a private security teams who were playing a very crucial role in 
admitting COVID-infected patients into a hospital, cordoning off areas, transporting medical personnel, ensuring social distancing and other healthcare protocol, protocols, as well as implementing temp temperature checks, et cetera. Again, this kind of frontline activity that private security is involved in, very much embedded in these systems of engaging with a range of different types of harms associated with these two harmscapes of the Novocene um, and the Anthropocene. So I will now turn back uh, to Clifford to reflect on private security's lines of flight or the future of private security. Okay, thank you, Julie. All right, so let's now ask the question. So what might all this, and Julie has just touched on tiny examples, what might all this mean for the future of policing? And more specifically, given our focus today, what will this mean for the future of private security? What is likely to happen to the policing web, to these, this mixture of private and public security and partnerships? And what is going to happen? What is happening? And where is this likely to lead? And <clears throat> what will private security tomorrow look like? We have a sort of picture in our mind of private security now, especially in South Africa, uh, a picture of it, but is this picture going to still be appropriate? And what will the picture of private security look like tomorrow? Uh, of course, it is still too early to answer this question with any degree of certainty. But having said that, there are, as we have seen from Julie's remarks, suggestive signs emerging, a variety of new lines of flight within policing are beginning to emerge like a flock of birds taking off. As a result, it seems pretty clear that we are into a third revolution in policing, which is what a button called a second revolution, but are now uh, framing a third. And once again, it is a revolution that has private security at the center. And that's why I gave that little history, because private security has been at the center of all the changes that have taken place in policing, including the development of public police and its dominance. So it also looks as if this third revolution is going to be a quiet revolution. It is going to be quiet because what is shaping these developments in policing is not policy. It's not what governments are doing. It's not policy that's coming out, nor is it new theoretical developments but rather the responses of security professionals operating on the front line of these developments. These changes are harmscape driven and professional driven. So let me give, given our time constraints, let me just note two lines of flight that we might think of. The first line of flight is diversity. By this I mean that the sorts of organizations involved in private security are both growing in exponentially, as Julie had just outlined, just the cybersecurity experts are twice the number of public place, and that's only a tiny bit of the security industry. And this growth is characterized by a lot of organizational diversity. There's a lot of different kinds of organizations emerging, as the two examples that Julie gave illustrate so nicely. Indeed, what we are witnessing can perhaps be thought of as private security on diversity introducing steroids. The old face of private security was of guards and detectives, 
dealing largely with the taking and hitting harms I mentioned earlier. This face of private security is still around. You can still hire private security to do, do just that. But new elements, new facets are emerging as we saw just a few minutes ago. Today, the private security sector is made up of a whole new gamut of policing agencies. Agencies that if they existed at all, would have been pretty unusual just a couple of decades ago. Indeed, they would have been almost unthinkable. These developments are therefore requiring a complete rethink of what private security is and what it does. They are also requiring a rethink of what policing is and a rethink of the nature of the policing web. Although there are clear similarities between the old and the new, there are also clear differences. For example, while policing the bots that are disrupting electric, that can disrupt the electricity supplies by interrupting the operation of circuit breakers and policing the bots that are locking down computer systems until ransoms are paid can be thought of as patrolling. This patrolling is very different indeed from the patrolling of office buildings at night or the patrolling of perimeters of gated communities. And yet, notwithstanding these differences, both the old and the new here can be thought of as involved in guarding and involved in doing detective work. But because this new guarding and this new detective work is very different, very different. The guards require different skills. The detectives require different skills. And these skills are, this, this change in skills, these change in what we might think of as policing assets are changing private security in very significant ways indeed. And all of this, as, as I have noticed and as Julie noticed, is leading to enormous growth within the private security sector. I mean, exponential steroidal growth and to considerable diversity. <clears throat> and this growth in diversity is changing the face of private security very significantly indeed. Perhaps, perhaps we might think of these developments as charting a new line of flight within the private sector that is not only reshaping private security today, but will certainly reshape it tomorrow as well. Let me now turn to the second line of flight I mentioned, namely a shift to resilience. As the landscapes of policing have been changing, so too have the objectives of policing. And at the center of these changes has been the emergence of resilience as a new and central objective of policing within the private security sector. One way of characterizing the shift is to see the shift as a shifting in the meaning of prevention. Indeed, we might thinking, think of prevention, traditional pre prevention morphing into resilience. This shift from prevention to resilience has happened because one of the features of the harmscapes of both the Anthropocene and the Novocene is radical uncertainty. Indeed, a phrase that has been used to characterize our age of catastrophe has been that it is also an age of uncertainty. What this means, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, is that one of the features of our present condition and our present harmscapes 
is that they are full of unknown unknowns. And what this means is that private security professionals are being required to acknowledge that notwithstanding their best preventative efforts, they are going to be faced with responding to catastrophes. So they need to accept this and they are accepting this. And then their focus is moving from to recovery, how to recover. And the better, of course, they enhance recovery, the better off their clients will be. A metaphor that is being used to recognize this task of recovery and what it's involved has been bouncing, both bouncing back to an old normal and bouncing forward to a new normal. The term that is used to capture the, this pogo stick-like and trampling-like bouncing is resilience. The idea here is that organizations and processes are resilient when they can recover quickly from harmscapes. Much is happening to develop new policing patterns that enable resilience, both within the harmscapes of the Anthropocene and those of the Novocene. This search for resilience, coupled with diversity, is constituting the elements of the third revolution of policing that is emerging. And private security is once again at the forefront of these developments. And with these thoughts in mind, it's once again Julie's turn to take up the, the baton here and ask, what does this mean for South Africa? So thank you, Clifford. Um, this is our last slide. It's a little bit text heavy, but in terms of the prospects for South Africa, Clifford and I wanted to present a set of design principles that we have been working on for a number of years, most of which we were working on while we were in South Africa, exploring private security and policing arrangements in South Africa. So I think this is very pertinent. And so I'll briefly go through each of these principles and there are six of them. So uh, perhaps a good starting point, and this was our starting principle was to have some sort of vision. And I think the first principle is to embrace this polycentricity. And I think that's one of the strengths of the South African context in terms of embracing plurality and polycentricity. It's not like that in other contexts where there's still very much kind of a state-centric vision of how to engage with these harmscapes with support mechanisms maybe. We're talking about a radical polycentricity. So our first principle is really what the term Clifford has, has adopted and used is this concept of a whole of society. Um, in fact, Clifford and I would argue that a plural polycentric system is the only way to, to engage with these new harmscapes as no single institution has the capacity or the knowledge or the resources on its own to deal with both old and new harmscapes. So in many respects, private security is already fulfilling this um, in terms of operating within polycentric networks of engagement, it needs to collaborate with others in any way because of a range of factors such as its powers, uh, because of the nature of it, its activities, the types of public, private and hybrid spaces it operates in. It has a history of engaging with others. It's a natural setting to engage in, in others in terms of a variety of dynamics around that. So in terms of the second principle, governing through harm, we talk about governing through harm in that we're dealing with these new harmscapes in a harm-based framing. We can't buy into a crime-based response. You can't arrest a hurricane or a storm. <laughs> you need to engage with the harm itself and mitigating that harm, mitigating the impacts of it. So COVID is a good example. So it's much bigger than just arresting people and imprisonment. You're dealing with broader harms. And again, private security is very flexible in terms of it's always been focused on harms. It's always had a risk-based approach um, in many respects to engaging with these, these issues because it doesn't necessarily have the power to, to buy into a governing through crime response. So the third principle is really, there's no point in trying to go for a whole of society, polycentric way of thinking and a harm-based way of thinking if your institutions aren't aligned to that. It's very difficult if your institutions are in a govern, governing through crime framing to turn it into something else. Private security is already institutionally positioned to be a harm-based whole of society institution for a variety of reasons. It is fully 
positioned and geared towards holistic responses because of its flexibility. It is a flexible institution. It responds to harms in different ways. Um, and it's able to adapt more effectively. Principle four is about functional budgeting. You can't undertake these, this different approach to de dealing with harmscapes if you don't have a budget which is adaptable and flexible to be able to allow you to do that. And again, private security has a strength in this regard because it has budgets which are flexible. If you need to buy a set of hazmat suits or if you need a fleet of fire trucks, the budget is used for whatever is needed to deal with that harm because they're a business. Um, it's quite easy for them to have a functional flex flexible budget as opposed to, for instance, a state department which has siloed budgets for particular purposes. The fifth principle is a bit trickier because it's about getting policing entities to align to a common or a, or a public good. Um, and both the private sector and the public police sector don't necessarily do this. It's not a given that the public police will necessarily perform policing to the good of all. We know that specifically in South Africa and all parts of the world, they are politicized or you know they align to particular goods. Some communities are more policed than others. So it's a problem for policing in its entirety to align to a common or a public good. And for private security, this means that it needs to not only cater to a private or a client good or vested interests, but I found and others have found that if the conditions are right, private security most certainly does provide security for a common or a public good. Um, and the examples that I've, I've used have attested to this already, that they do in fact align to public good. So that's a myth that they only cater to uh, their business interests, they only cater to their clients. If the conditions are right, they sometimes produce security for a public good more so than the public sector does. Lastly, in terms of, of regulation, I've put the design principle here around innovation in terms of regulation and accountability. And there's a whole literature around, if you have these polycentric systems, how, do you, how does accountability and regulation work around them? What is, you know, comes up tops in these, in these literatures is the fact that you can't just have traditional top-down regulatory systems. And so, you know, the, the private security industry in South Africa is beset with problems. This is a universal problem. It's, it's all over the world that private security struggles with low standards, poor training, poor quality. It's not just unique to South Africa. These are problems all over the world. Uh, however, my research and others have shown again that if the conditions are right, private security can operate in polycentric networks which promote innovative forms of regulation and accountability not just through licensing and traditional forms of regulation. That's another aspect of it, but within the networks that they are happening on the ground, and that, that's the reference to horizontal and vertical accountability. Uh, and I borrow this term of um, horizontal accountability from the criminologist John Braithwaite, who talks about accountability interactionally that happens on the ground between entities. And I've seen this happen in, in South Africa, and it is possible for innovative regulation to happen from the bottom up um, in terms of making these polycentric networks function accountably and to the public good. So those are our six design principles. Again, they were drafted from within South Africa and they're still pertinent to South Africa uh, in terms of, well, what are the next steps in terms of you know, in engaging with this third revolution in private security? So I will end there and then we can open up for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julian Clifford, a really insightful and kind of invigorating conversation about private security because we tend to get stuck in the nitty gritty. We tend to just look at kind of case study examples, not look at the bigger picture. And I think also the global picture. So it really does help us understand what's happening in South Africa relative to what's happening in other countries, but also where there is considerable um, kind of thinking going on behind private security. So, so a number of big terms, but also thank you so much to, to Clifford and Julie for making them accessible because usually when uh, you have these kind of conversations, they, it can go over a lot of people's heads. So I think you made it very easy for us to understand the new concepts, but also the new directions and flight paths as you call them. So what we have now, we have about half an hour for questions or comments. So I'm gonna open up for those comments and questions please do use the raise the hand function. If you don't have, can't access the raise the hand function, just 
uh, open up the chat and just put question in the chat and then I can see if you're wanting to raise a question. Um, what uh, ideally we want to do is take a few questions and hand back to Julia and Clifford. So I see one hand up already, but if others want to raise your hands, please do. Um, so I'm going to start with Hannes Kukumbu. Over to you, Hannes. Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, let me just position this. Okay, no, it's not going to um, Good day. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Thanks. Okay, thanks. cool. Um, so my question is more regarding um, uh, the technological advances that happens in other fields and whether private security are using them. For instance, the emergence of thinking engines and deep learning engines and the use in private security. For instance, um, uh, organic algorithms to predict crimes and to predict future harms and whether that is being used. And because that is also a, a solely private security uh, scene and private entity scene. I believe no, there's no um, state entity that's fully um, use that. I know some governments like the Netherlands and some American states are utilizing the technology, but they don't own the technology. They're basically paying licensing to it. So they're basically doing that um, half and half of a company. So it just would be interesting if either Julie or Clifford has seen that emerged. It would be interesting to see it because if if all the security companies could pull their data into a um, deep learning engine, they could basically bridge the gap in the unknown of the new world. That's kind of my question. Cool. Thanks, Hannes. I don't see any other hands at the moment, but Martin did put a question in the chat. And for those of you not seeing the chat, it just says, what are the implications for local poor and inequality? I presume he's referring to um, kind of the various debates and big concepts and big directions you were talking about. Um, but I do see a hand up from Mulungu. Mulungu, over to you. Mulungu, we can't hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for affording me this opportunity. Um, I'm very much grateful that I'm part of this session, mainly because I'm heading a department that is um, in a local municipality at Mumbasha, local municipality in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. And um, we, 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 we didn't have a, a background or something informing us on either considering uh, internalized security, which means um, public security, that our own security or hiring private security. And at the moment, we're having both. We've got private security guards and we've got our own security guards that are employed by the municipality. So the information I got here is it's more empowering. And I don't have particularly a question but to say the information is empowering and at least one can have facts in whatever we are doing. Then the other thing that I wanted to hear from the presentation was the role of the regulating bodies, particularly in South Africa. We've got CIRA, we've got a state security agency, we've got the whole agencies in this. So I, I just wanted to check the, their role in this case was not touched in this one particular presentation. Maybe the role or the impact, their impact in regulating the whole uh, system. So that was my just a comment from my side. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm very grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Mulungu. Thanks so much for your input. Uh, Julian Clifford, do you want to respond so long whilst others think of comments and questions? Um, and then we'll come back for a second round after you've responded. Um, I can. Thank you, Hannes. It's a long time to see. Um, 
that is, I mean, the question you asked is very interesting because there's so many developments that I haven't engaged with that the developments I can't even keep up with. And what we didn't specify in this in this presentation was what we actually mean by private security. And that concept in itself is being stretched. So what I'm seeing in the UK, just to kind of answer your question, um, is the involvement of pri the private sector and the state sector in kind of hybrid formations and arrangements where it's difficult to see where one starts and the other ends, um, engage with high level cybersecurity issues and structures. Um, and there's a lot of work around uh, engaging with, with this, with the private security industry, um, but also kind of this revolving door between the two and this kind of hybridization. So I don't know if it's so clear cut with private security in the state anymore, because I'm seeing this blurring of the two consultancies who merge between the two. And also Mark Button is talking about private security as in people who are, they call them pedophile hunters in the UK who go and target people on, on Facebook or wherever, and then they go um, and ex expose them. So private security itself, the concept is, is fluid and, and fluctuating. And I think that's what the third revolution is a lot about. So yes, we have, a lot of engagement with uh, um, AI, big data, deep learning uh, from both sides. And then as policies are developing, you see the merging of the two because of a response to the harmscape in itself, rather than trying to differentiate, okay, this is for private security and this is for the, for the public sector. So I don't know if that helps uh, much, but there's so many developments that I haven't been able to even keep pace with them. But there's a lot happening around um, developing these systems of kind of merging of, of entities and hybrid formations of, of engaging. So these, these are the radical polycentric networks we're talking about. And we still, to our detriment of, of making them up as state, non-state, public, private, high and low policing. But actually, um, I don't think we, we've kept pace with the hybridization of that in developing responses to, to cyber threats and e evolving technologies. Clifford, do you want to engage with the uh, implications for local poor and inequality, given your involvement with the Community Peace yeah. Program? Yes, I will. And um, I'll, I'll also just add to your comment for Hannes. Um, of course, Hannes, there's a huge uptake of all kinds of technologies in both the examples that Julie gave and the work we've been doing on private security in the banking industry. Of course, there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on, deep learning and this and the other. But as Julia says that it, it's hard to give just a single answer to this. Um, one, has to, one has to look particularly, but I could certainly answer that there's no absence of innovation with technology uh, across private security. Um, you know, whether you're gonna get the kind of, of you know, sharing that you talked about. And, and this brings me to, to, to Martin's point. <clears throat> I mean, policing has always been riddled with inequality, whether it's public policing or private policing. And certainly, as we all know from the old private policing in South Africa, uh, there's, it, it's, there are lots of inequalities because, um, uh, you know, whether it's public policing, if you live in a wealthy area, you get better policing than if you live in a poor area, if you can hire private security, do things. So um, clearly, the, these are crucial issues. And this raises Mlungu's issue of the, of the, of, of the issue of regulation uh, to, to try, and put a try and put a limit on this. But take the Anthropocene. One of the things we're finding, and I've written about it with my uh, uh, colleague Simpson, Nick Simpson, is what we call climate gating. And that is some people take load shedding. Some people are able to deal with load shedding more easily than others. They're able to put on panels on their home, they're able to, to, to create autonomous systems. Whole communities are able to go autonomous access to water, access to electricity, uh, being able to protect yourself in a heating planet. This is all going to lead to large inequalities. And uh, in the very first writing I did with David Bailey on private security, <clears throat> we said, just like any placing, 
So I wish I could say that um, there are, this is going to lead to greater equality. No, it's not. That we need to be um, vigilant. Yes, we do. That regulatory issues have to be looked at. And Julie will talk about regulation is falling behind development, as it always does. This is not just a, a policing issue. Where our regulatory systems, our licensing systems were designed for yesterday's private security, not for today's private security. So there's a regulatory issue there too. Thank you. So to carry on um, about regulation, yes, Clifford is right. I mean, this is a, lo a long battle in terms of trying to understand re regulation as something different than just an external body coming in and licensing or checking up on things. It plays a small part in that. Um, think about regulation in cyberspace. How do you regulate all those entities in cyberspace? Do you have a state body coming in and looking at them? And I mean, sometimes, but most of the time, the regulation happens informally. It happens through contract. It happens through censure. It happens through a range of different systems in place, which are interactional, which happens between people. And I think the regulatory bodies need to understand how regulation works on the ground rather than trying to come in and regulate. That has a part to play. But I've been finding that a lot happens in terms of the interactions on the ground between people holding each other accountable if the conditions are right. And the challenge is, of course, to align that to, to a good that we want, because, of course, organized crime networks can also have very good trust relationships and accountability relationships that could be well regulated, too, uh, because of these interactional dynamics. So I think there's scope to investigate innovative regulatory systems where we acknowledge how entities interact with each other on the ground and hold each other accountable in various ways. So that needs to be understood as a bigger system than just an external body coming in after the fact, mostly after the fact. Or um, if it is preventative, then there's only so much you could do in terms of, of licensing to engage with bigger regulatory issues. And now we're also talking about um, another space altogether, cyberspace, which has a, another layer of complexity associated with, with that. Thank you. Thanks, Judy and Clifford. Some really, really kind of interesting responses to questions there. Um, we have some other people who are posing questions. So I've got John. Um, I presume it's John Cartwright. I just see John on my screen. Um, and then there's a couple of questions in the chat. So uh, John, if you'd like to ask your question, then we'll go to the chat after you. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up a couple of points that have been made about polycentric policing. And the necessity, one of the principles, the necessity to invent institutional arrangements that promote that mutual respect for of different contributions, rather than have the uh, the enforcement arm uh, dominant. And uh, just that, and this um, Mlungu made me think also in this in relation to this about the power of local government. Um, very much underestimated, I think, in their capacity to bring uh, different kinds of resource together uh, in the public good. That's what functioning municipalities do anyway. They have a huge range of departments for roads and sewers and housing and uh, informal trading, etc. And they try to link with one another to help the community become a better place to live. And if policing can be added into this, as we have been experimenting, one has to fight against the assumptions that any alternative to the reactive um, enforcement model is actually just soft stuff and doesn't and is not effective. But I think the whole of society approach that Clifford and Julia are talking about actually may, is the framework within which other contributions on the ground from communities, from law enforcement, uh, local law enforcement, and linking with SAPs uh, can function. So that it's not just a top-down, but a ground-up and locally-based um, polycentricity as well. That's really all I wanted to say. Thanks, John. Um, 
I have a question from Vili van Scaife in the chat. I mean, I'm happy to read it, but just Julian, if you want to look as well, it says, are you aware of any formal arrangements between the SAPs and private security companies in South Africa to support the SAPs in the suburbs? I think as you've just heard John say, there are lots of things happening. Uh, so I'm aware of a lot. I mean, for the and you say to perform, there's lots of attempts to build partnerships. Um, in fact, you know, savvy, uh, the thing that uh, the work that Guy's been doing has been very much about this. So I am aware of it, uh, whether these uh, can be enhanced, improved, whether they're adequate, whether they're harmful. And this comes to Martin's point. I mean, to describe something isn't to endorse it. Uh, the question is, New technologies, I wouldn't say will promote, but they may be very likely to promote harmful outcomes. They can do it. There's lots of attempts like with body-worn cameras of the police to hopefully create um, different outcomes, less harmful outcomes of that. There's a lot of controversy at the moment, especially in the US with uh, what's going on in policing there where the body-worn cameras are doing that. So these are all empirical agendas. And I suppose the purpose of our talk was to say, we're not, unless you see what's happening, you can't have an empirical research agenda around it. If you don't understand, see what's happening, that private security today is not the same as yesterday. So what we were inviting were, empirical agendas and research to explore it. Julie, do you want to add to that? Um, yes, I mean, and, and uh, Clifford and I have always had on the agenda, well, the reality is that we're in a polycentric world. What do we do with that polycentric world? And there are challenges and, and negatives that come out of that, of course. Um, and that was the process of us developing these design principles. Well, how do you get to the point that these networks of engagement aren't authoritarian and damaging? Uh, and of course, it's been very difficult um, in terms of a range of different um, difficulties in, in South Africa and, and globally as well. So that's kind of our normative mission. Um, but the first step is to acknowledge that it's a polycentric world and you cannot just deny it and cannot just say, well, we're going to not engage with this group. It's to harness the capacities of those who have a part, potential part to play in it. Thanks. Right, thanks. We've got uh, three hands up at the moment. So I'm going to allow them to ask their questions or make their comments and, if, um, and see how long that takes us because we've got about 12 minutes. So I've got Lisa Vetten, Philemon, and then Derica. So Lisa, if you'd like to make a comment or ask your question, and then I'll ask the other two uh, after you, directly after you. Lisa, over to you. Okay, so a couple of questions. The first was, I was wondering in your homescapes, if you've been thinking about the other kind of odd hybrid where you have private security playing a role in conflict. I'm just thinking, for instance, recently in Mozambique, for example, where private, a private security company from South Africa was going in to look at um, some of the attacks from the Mozambican oil fields in, and now the name's gone out of, my, out of my head. But I think those kinds of situations where private security is almost mercenary, almost army, almost policing and guarding, to me, the potential for that, and I think especially as we have an answer, as we move into the kind of climate that harm we see, is that that kind of role can become greater as there might be further conflict over things like water and other things. So I'm just wondering how you see that fit in, in, in your harm's head. I mean, I, I think the question of regulation is very interesting. We can just see that in relation to Facebook, for example. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts around how regulation works, because that leads to my third question, is that there's obviously some very important changes going on in the nature of the state. And these questions of regulation and divisions between private and public and how people intervene. I don't think you've got any kind of novel examples as to how people would engage in those kinds of regulation without exacerbating some of the inequalities that people are talking to. I mean, as it is in South Africa, I think with the rate, just trying to hold the police accountable to our existing systems is incredibly difficult. Um, and I think look at the kind of corruption and other difficulties going on. 
how would one engage with that in the private security space? You know, because I'm not sure, I don't know that very well, but how well does something like Syrah function when you do have difficulties in relation to private security? How do people engage with the complexities of AI or everyday citizen like me, who has a very basic grasp of it, but how on earth would I be able to hold accountable to even understand what's been what's going on and what about people who don't even have access in many parts of the country to wi-fi the like and all the other sophisticated technologies do you have any examples of how that's being thought i'm sorry these are very confused questions but what you're saying is very interesting and provocative i'm just trying to get my head around it thanks thanks lisa um over to you philemon uh can, can, can you hear me yes we can hear you Benamon. and again we can see you as well okay so it's like my 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 question is uh it's in relation to the south african context actually uh uh there have been allegations of 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 poor training actually in the in the in the private security industry where a person get uh, hired today and then next week uh, this person is driving a cash van and then they get attacked and then this person is unable to, 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 to deal with the risk. So my question is that would you say there is enough training in the private security in South Africa? Thank you. Thanks, Felemon. Next on the list is Derica. Over to you, Derica. Hi, Guy. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'll try and keep it really short. Um, thank you to the two presenters. Um, the question relates to should private security always be formalized? And, and the, the reason why I ask that is, is looking at private security in the form of non-state policing or non, let's call it non-state guarding. Um, in the South African context, we have seen an increase in vigilante attacks or vigilante incidents. Um, would for the speakers, would you when when is there a spillover of private security into the vigilante realm? Um, I think it's something that we should increasingly look at because it's also a form of providing security. Um, I was thinking about also um, the private security with, relates, with, with regards to who guards the criminal. Um, Zama Zamas, the illegal gold miners up north, they are guarded by a private army. Um, however, they stand firmly within the criminal field. Um, I was thinking about communities um, in, on the South African border with Mozambique guarding uh, wildlife in that specific area. Should we regard that as a form of private security? And, and then also the question of, of vigilante groups. Um, and, and then I guess that goes back to the first question about the formality. Should private security always be formalized? Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Derica. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat just to kind of uh, summarize them. So from Varsha Patel, we have a question about the sort of how do we uh, develop ground level capacity to promote whistleblowing and or social movements as part of the broader networks of control or regulation. And then Marita asked the question around should we have who should have oversight over the cybersecurity measures? So um, to Julian Clifford, you can look at the, the questions in a bit more detail there. Uh, we have about seven minutes left. So I'm gonna hand back to the two speakers to respond. And then after this, we will wrap up the webinar. So Julia or Clifford, who wants to go first? So I think Julie should, but I'll go because she's not putting her hand up to go. Um, I've lost track of all the questions, so I'm totally right now. <laughs> I think that for me, we don't have any answers to all of these. These are all the kinds of questions that need to be asked. But whether one could just say one has answers. So to issue of Philemon's, is there enough training? Of course, there are lots of areas of very poor training, uh, especially around traditional guards. This is almost always to do with the contracting process. You know, you want to get your, your, your guarding done as cheaply as possible. On the other hand, if you go into banks and look at private security, 
uh, guarding and policing the bots that are doing cyber attacks, the training is enormously sophisticated. So my answer to Philemon is depends where you look. Um, and it, it's varied. Um, to go to Derricka's uh, questions, of course, policing is always a contested space. What you talk about the non formalized uh, gangs are engaged in policing. They just have different objectives they're trying to pursue. Um, so this is a contested space and vigilantes are, uh, are always around. Now, there, there are contests between them. Very often you're trying to, you'll have uh, policing systems trying to control that and the gang areas and all of that. So, so yes, and I'll, I'll leave Julie to, to, to have a crack at some of the other ones. Well, I'm um, happy to do it, Julie, but I don't want to talk all the time. No, well, we could maybe do a relay. So there was a lot coming out of it. And I think a lot of the questions are, for me, a narrative of, of kind of a negative conception of private security is somehow different to the public police or the state. So um, it's not criticizing anybody, but... Is, you're looking at private security as if it's somehow separate or different, but there's a continuity of activities, again, this hybridization of the public and the private. And so, for instance, Derica, when you talk about formalizing private security, who's doing the formalizing? The state. I mean, there are assumptions around who should be doing what. Uh, what if the state is the problem? Um, kind of there's assumptions around that it has to come from this source or that source. It has to come from this or that. Um, that private security is, is I mean, it's it, what we don't understand. Yes, it's difficulty in holding the, the public police account, accountable, let alone anybody else. But I think there's a need to engage with the realities on the ground of the incentives around private security because there are assumptions about this because the, the research in private security is relatively small compared to what we know about public police entities. So we make assumptions about um, its incentives and, and what it does and, and how it works and how it's regulated. Um, and I think that's a starting point in terms of trying to engage with the, re the radical, radical nature of these activities that they're involved in as, as well as a network. So a lot of the questions are based on particular assumptions that we also need to think about, uh, particularly in, in South African context and the African context. Um, and in terms of regulation, I think there was a question around engaging with com complex regulatory uh, systems in, in cyberspace, there's so many different ways of regulating cyberspace. Um, there are formal systems, yes, command and control, hard law, criminal law, civil law, extradition orders, disclosure laws. There's uh, a range of informal systems, which are just as good in, in many respects, depending on the forum. Um, shared norms or rules or ideologies. There's a colleague of mine in Edinburgh who does research on the dark web and a lot of the interactions of criminal networks, which you can actually learn from, is around shared norms. It's around trust, um, you know, and they're very well regulated. Uh, but we have particular assumptions. Okay, it has to be formal. It has to be like this. So other types of ways in which cyberspace is regulated is through uh, mutual or negotiated through contract or service level agreements or market incentives. There's also a lot of self-regulation that happening, a lot of code, which is embedded regulation embedded into these systems. So I think we just need to be a little bit imaginative in terms of innovations in regulation and the realities on the ground and the incentives of these, these entities and, and challenge a little bit more our assumptions that the state should formalize or the state should do that or it's only private security that does that because there's a there's a negative narrative around private security but Clifford and I are, are not denying that we're trying to say well if we have these systems what can we do to improve them um, and the challenge for us then is to do empirical research to understand these local level dynamics first before we make assumptions about about where we should take the, the regulation. Uh, I don't know if that answered all the questions, but I, I did make an attempt. Thanks, Julie. And we're pretty much one minute left, so we're going to wrap up this webinar. There were a few other comments and questions that are, that have appeared in the chat, but we, we won't be able to get to them, unfortunately. It was just a, a request that was put to me around whether uh, one of the participants wanted to engage with you and Clifford by email, if that's okay. 
um, or you did put your email addresses in the chat. So I just wanted to check if that's okay with you. I see head being nodded. So the person who asked the question, there we go. Um, and just to wrap up to say thank you so much to Julian Clifford. I think this was a really stimulating, interesting, insightful discussion that sort of takes us away from the kind of the, the challenges and the problems we often take, talk about sort of security and safety in South Africa. And of course, many of these things we're going to be confronted with. Um, we are going to be confronted with cybersecurity issues within South Africa. We've seen what's happened in Europe. We've seen what's happened within the US around, you know, kind of orchestrated cyber attacks and you know, in, embedding certain codes in, in uploaded uh, programs and how those compromise systems. So I think we're going to be seeing some of that in South Africa. Of course, we're going to be seeing the climate change stuff um, related to COVID. I think the big issue that's coming up where climate, private security is going to play a role is when things settle down, eventually it's going to be the land invasion issue to deal with because we've seen quite significant shifts and occupations of land during the lockdowns and um, you know, kind of governments being quite hamstrung in the sense that it can't really respond to, to these land invasions. So when, once things are back to, to similar to circumstances where they were, then obviously there's going to be this issue around how do you deal with this land invasion? And private security has provided solutions in the past, and they're, they're probably going to be a go-to in the future as well to, to work with government to deal with this. But nonetheless, we are at time. So thank you, everyone. If you look at the chat, if you want to go and see the recording or share the recording, it is going to be on Safer Spaces. And then just a very final word from my side, we're having a Safer Spaces, having a free a virtual web conference Monday and Tuesday, um, looking at the white paper on safety and security and lots of different themes, very interesting speakers that are going to be there. So if you're interested, just go to the Safer Spaces uh, website, look at the events side. It's also profiled on the landing page. And you can register for free. It's via Zoom. So you'll be very welcome to attend. So without any further ado, thank you so much to Julie and to Clifford for making the time to speak to us. And thanks to all of you for participating and for your really good questions and comments. Have a good weekend, everyone, and hopefully see you in another webinar sometime soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.